Hello everyone, my, thanks for joining today. My name is Jane nicholson -Biss. I'm the Stakeholder and Engagement Manager at the Institute of Leadership and Management. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect these and address them in the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Rod Jones, Content Manager at the Institute of Leadership and Management. Rod, over to you. Hello everyone and thank you Jane. And in turn, it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle MacArthur Morgan. Michelle MacArthur Morgan is the Principal Learning Consultant and Founding Partner of Jigsaw at Work Development Consultancy. Michelle creates programs to enable learners to be more agile and responsive in our constantly changing and increasingly demanding workplace environment in order to help businesses thrive. Michelle works with organisations to increase workplace awareness and mental health. She enables a better understanding of how neuroscience can be used to improve psychological safety and mental well-being. Michelle is a mindful practitioner and also a qualified mental health first responder. And over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Rod, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. So, how to create a mentally healthy workplace. In the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at if I can get this slide to work, it's not doing that. There we go. If we are going to look at discussing the role of the manager in respect to mental health and well-being, look at identifying some of the signs of mental illness, how we can actually spot and identify those early warning signs, ways of supporting colleagues in the workplace, and we will finish up by looking at ways of taking a more proactive rather than the reactive response of how to create mentally healthy workplaces. So I'd like to spend just a couple of moments actually and ask you to get involved by typing into your chat box some typical words that either you yourself associate excuse me, with mental health, or perhaps words that you've heard other people use when talking about mental health, or perhaps people that, who, ha, who are experiencing some form of mental issue. So if you could just type just a couple of words uh, that you either, as I say, either you personally associate or others associate with mental health, please. And then Jane, yes. Goodness me, lots and lots of things <laughs> going through. So stress, anxiety, stress again, um, resilience, disability, Brilliant. anxious. Yeah. I'm just trying to filter through those. Uh, get a grip is one. Yeah. Everyone has mental health and depression. Depression, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I've got to say, you've been quite polite in honesty compared to when I do this in a face to face situation. These are just a sample of some of the words that we tend to get uh, that people associate, and these tend to be some of the politer ones. I wouldn't dare to show some of the um, other words that I do tend to get from time to time. So, as you can see, there are lots of words that are not very pleasant, not very nice words at all. However, somebody did mention the word resilient and that we all have mental health. And these are some of the more positive words that I would like people to think more about in respect of mental health. Because one of the things, it's very easy to, and I'm sure you've all come across it, that actually, I know society is changing a little bit and people's attitudes are changing a little bit, not only employers, but within society to mental health. But there is still it is still so much easier to actually think of all the negative terms that we relate to mental health rather than the positive terms that we can relate to mental health. In a recent study, 27% of employees said they would be reluctant to speak out about their mental health. 36% said they would be afraid of what their colleagues would say. And personally, I would argue that that's probably significantly higher than that in reality. Um, 
based on my experience of working with organizations, then uh, when I start to talk about mental health and, and kind of the number of people who just would not be comfortable to speak out uh, about mental health if they felt that they were having some form of, of mental health issues. And somebody quite rightly said there, the one thing that actually we all tend to forget is that we all have mental health. And without it, if we didn't have mental health, we wouldn't actually exist. So we all have mental health. And that's something that we do tend to overlook. There is something known as the mental health continuum because mental health is not fixed. Just as Fit when with physical health, there are days when we don't feel too well, we've got perhaps a little bit of a, a cold coming on, we've perhaps got an injury, but our mental, our physical health isn't, it can, shall we say, at peak condition. Mental health is exactly the same in that. And we should all be checking in with ourselves to see where we actually are on that mental health continuum. Because yes, there will be days when we're, we're resilient and we're strong, and it doesn't matter what anybody throws at us or asks of, asks of us, we can cope. There'll be other days when we perhaps haven't had a good night's sleep or there's a lot of things going on. And you know what? Things seem so much more of a challenge. Even some of the smaller kind of things that we'd normally just take in our stride seem so much more of a challenge. So it is worth us all from time to time actually just move, just checking in with ourselves and just asking ourselves, how am I actually feeling today? How is my mental health today? Am I getting a good night's sleep? Do I feel strong and resilient? So now what I'd just like to do is start to move on, having introduced the subject of mental health. And again, if you could just, just type a couple of words in the, the chat box and then Jane will read them out for us again. And this time what I'm looking for is how we can recognize what are some of those early warning signs that we can actually look for in an individual that actually might warn us that something, perhaps their mental health is not at that strong resilience end and they're perhaps starting to move down the continuum so what, some, somewhat. So if you could just put some words in there, what are some of those early warning signs you would hope to look for? And Jane, have we got some answers? Drinking more, irritability, forgetfulness, lack of concentration, smoking, unhappy, hiding yeah. in toilets, <laughs> isolated, yeah. not performing to their usual standard, overly yeah. happy, yes. different reaction to different circumstances, lack of presence, out of character, yeah. no eye Absolutely. contact. <laughs> It's great. There's so many people coming through. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> missing, missing days off work. I think we could yep. go on all afternoon with this, but um, I think I think that's most of them. Yep, that's brilliant. And absolutely, there is no one, and this is the important thing to remember, there is no one sign. It's different for everybody. And putting it simply, it's a change to the person's normal behaviour. That's what we need to look at. If somebody is, is quite a quiet person, you might actually perceive them to be quite a quiet and withdrawn person doesn't mean to say that there's something wrong necessarily. That might just be their preferred style. On the other hand, there could be somebody who is quite outgoing and very excitable. Again, doesn't mean to say that there's anything wrong with them. It could be their preferred style. But on the other hand, if somebody who perhaps normally is quite an excitable type of person uh, and quite a loud person, if they come into the office, and I'm not just talking about, you know, for a few hours here or there, but if they come into the office and they're a little bit quieter, a little bit more withdrawn, and this kind of continues, it's that change to the person's normal behaviour that we do actually need to look at. So no one sign. It's all about looking for those changes to a person's normal behavior. So bear, with that in mind, who then, my next thought is, who are the best placed people to identify the signs of mental illness at that early stage in the workplace? Now, the best placed person is somebody who has a regular kind of contact with them, tends to be the manager. 
or the, the team supervisor who has the most kind of or most regular type of communication contact with them so they often are the best place people the line manager is the best place person to actually identify these changes to a person's normal behavior but if the line managers are going to be effective at recognizing these signs at that very early stage it actually has implications for the way that they then manage and relate to their teams so it's all about managers will need to have regular informal chats i'm not talking about the formal job chats i'm not talking about it taking up long periods of time it's just that how are you in the morning sometimes just that smile maybe going for a coffee with them from time to time. Again, I'm not talking about every day or even every week, but just catching up with them on that informal basis. Knowing and being aware of, of team members, individuals' behaviours. So you actually know a little bit about them, their behaviours, their preferences, how they react to certain things. Taking an actual interest in the individual as a person, creating relationships of trust and encouraging that openness and honesty so they feel confident and able to have these conversations. And likewise, managers do. Now, very often when I, again, I'm talking through these with groups of people, they'll say, but our managers do all that. We do all that. OK, I'll give you that. Maybe they do. But if that is so, why then, when researchers look at why people leave organisations, and the line managers always want the top three reasons. If the relationships with line managers in general terms, and obviously there's good and there's not so good, but in general terms, if line managers, the relationship with our line managers is so good, why then are they also one of those top three uh, reasons why people leave? So let's kind of move on and assume that we have a line manager who has and does all these things, has a great relationship with the team and has noticed somebody who possibly could be showing signs of some form of, of mental issue, some form of mental illness. What should they do? Well, we use the ACOR model. Approach, communicate, offer support and information, reach out to professionals and nurture support from others. So if I just spend a, a few moments just going through each one of these. Approach, first of all, this is often one of the most difficult things to do. Often, lack of confidence, managers don't want to upset or say the wrong thing, make things worse. Sometimes perhaps even a fear of a, a lawsuit by saying the wrong thing, they don't know what to say. Or a big one these days, even just finding the time. And very often it's just so much easier just to hope that it, it'll all sort itself out, it will just go away. Well, unfortunately, these things tend not to go away. And if we don't intervene at this early stage, then we can end up with the person developing more serious mental health issues, which could involve taking significant amount of time away from the workplace. So having approach, we then obviously need to communicate. And one of the things that people who have experienced mental health issues, they often say is they just wish that line managers, family members, colleagues had spoken to them about how they were actually feeling and just asked, you know, so they felt that they could talk freely about how they were actually feeling, what they were experiencing. And people, as I say, who have experienced mental health issues have actually said it's such a big relief when somebody just just stops and opens up that conversation and asks how they are feeling. And this is where line managers may need some help and support to be able to develop non-judgmental communication skills and build the confidence that they need in order to talk about it, to know what to say. Asking a person how they feel is absolutely fine. Saying something that you've noticed they've been looking rather tired lately or they've been coming into work later than normal lately. Asking them if everything is OK. Asking them if there's anything you can do to help them. It's absolutely fine, but it's not fine to, say, to tell somebody to calm down, to pull the socks up, just get on with it, get over it. Or asking them even, and I've, this is something that people have said to me, they've heard said, you know, asking them, are you insane? Are you a psycho? What's going on? 
this kind of approach is obviously not and I'm sure hopefully not many people here today would actually say those things but it does actually take place. The other thing we need to think about in communication is when and where we are going to communicate. We want to make sure that we're not going to be interrupted. We want to make sure that we turn our mobiles off, that we're somewhere where there won't be any distractions. It might be appropriate to actually leave the office, to actually go out for a, a cup of coffee or go somewhere more private where you can have a cup of coffee. Keep it very low key informal. So then we moved on to offer support and information. And this is simply where managers can find out, ask questions that find out what can you do as their line manager? What can you do to offer some support? It may well be that just being flexible with the start times for a couple of weeks is absolutely fine or lightening their workload just for a short period of time would be absolutely fine. And just those small little things at this very early stage make such a big difference and can save, as I say, an awful lot of upset for the individual at a later stage and prolonged periods of time away from the workplace. The next one is reach out to professionals. And if it's appropriate, and this isn't always appropriate to do, because if we've actually caught the, the kind of spotted the sign at that early stage, having those conversations and offering a little bit of reasonable support, reasonable adjustment may well be enough and hopefully will be enough. So you don't have to, the individual doesn't need to reach out to professionals. But if you feel that it may be appropriate to, as a line manager, really what we need to know is be aware of any employee assistance programs that you have available. And whilst you may think, well, everybody knows about them, maybe everybody doesn't really know about them or the individual hasn't actually thought about it or the individual doesn't know how to go about approaching the uh, asking for help through the employee assistance program also it's good to have a, a bit of a portfolio of local uh, groups that meet other services that are available locally that may be appropriate for them so you can actually signpost them to outside professional appropriate services. So the other thing that line managers under that little bit could do is also possibly, again, very much dependent on the individual, but it may be appropriate for you to actually offer them support to help them to make that first contact with the organization or to actually help them make that first appointment with them. Nurture support from others quite simply is they need that support, not only from yourself, the line manager within the workplace, but they also need support outside of the workplace. What family, what friends do they have that they could perhaps ask? Who could they ask? What kind of help could the family or friends actually give them? What could family and friends do to give them that support that they need away from the workplace? But having used the ACORN approach, having spoken to them, communicated, offered that support, find out how you can help, suggested family friends that perhaps may be able to help them talk through that, it doesn't stop there. Managers should let them know that they're going to be there for them, that they can come back and have this conversation again if they need to, that if they need to additional support or help if there's anything they want you will be there to actually help them it's not just about ticking the job off the to-do list so far we've looked at the reactive stage we hear stats in the media and press every day talking about how many people are, are suffering from stress and experiencing stress at work and we hear all those stats and yes we do need the, pro, the reactive actual response right here and now. And many organizations have gone down that reactive or what I call the, the sticking plaster approach. And yes, they've introduced gym memberships, offered mindfulness workshops perhaps, held mental health awareness days or mental health awareness workshops and things. They are needed, but they are not sufficient to be able to develop a sustainable, mentally healthy culture. As soon as we stop doing those workshops, focus and attention moves on to the next project and it gets kind of lost in the in the whole kind of busyness of the workplace. So 
one of the things that has come out is the way that organisations manage and support employees at work in order to sustain both their, their well-being and performance has become one of the critical differentiators of successful organisations. And there is now an increase in interest from organisations who would like to create a sustainable culture of positive mental well-being. For the last 10 years or so, I've been very fortunate enough to study with some of the world's leading neuro researchers and their findings that can help us. It's given us information to help us build resilient organisations who have mental health and well-being as the key focus of their culture. And if we look at some of the world giants, people such as Microsoft, KPMG, Hewlett Packard, Google, they're all starting to implement a new way of working which takes into account the capacity of the human mind and facilitates a more proactive approach to mental health and well-being. So just for the last few minutes, just want to kind of look at what are some of those first steps we can do to go in along that pathway. Uh, and I've picked out some of the kind of more simpler things that you can actually take away from today and go and start and try. The first thing is encourage regular breaks and technology free time. The human mind needs a break every 90 minutes, only one or two minutes at the most, but it needs a break. But all too often we kind of we feel thirsty and I'll get that cup of coffee in a moment and then that moment never comes we never find that time so regular frequent breaks are important lunch breaks minimum of 30 minutes away from our desk hopefully or certainly not discussing and doing work do you actually manage to get to your team manage to get regular lunch breaks if you say no way could we ever do that start just maybe one day a week, take a 30 minute lunch break. Encourage walk and talk meetings, encourage technology free meetings, get people to leave the mobiles, their laptops, their tablets outside the room and try having some technology free time. Be kind to the brain. The second one, take the capacity and resources of the human brain into account. The brain is very powerful, it's a great piece of kit but it has limited resources. It can only process in the conscious mind seven pieces of information per second compared to 11 million pieces of information per second of the unconscious mind. Now you think about your working environment and all the distractions, the noises that are going on around you, things that's going on, the emails popping up and pinging and dinging and phones ringing that's going off. All these are distractions that are taking away our, our conscious mind away from what we're trying to focus on. The mind can only hold two to three pieces of information at any one time. Multitasking is something else, a very bad habit that many of us have got into, trying to focus and do two or three things together. In actual fact, it's just false economy and creates actually a, a threat, what we call a threat response in the brain. The brain has only got limited energy and Every time we make a decision, it uses up and diminishes some of our brain's resources. Yet how often, just think about how many decisions, perhaps are done by unconsciously, you actually make in the morning before you've even got to work. Deciding, what do you want toast or do you want cereal? Which route are you going to take for work? Or what time is the, the which time train or bus are you going to perhaps catch? Listening to the radio, it's maybe just on in the background, but your brain is still, a part of the brain is still tuning into that and listening to what's being said and maybe making decisions about what's being said, whether you agree or disagree with something. Do you get good quality sleep? Is your brain fully rejuvenated in the morning? If we don't get our seven to nine hours sleep that we all need, the brain doesn't get the time to rejuvenate properly. Develop emotional intelligence of individuals. Actually encourage people to spend time reflecting, focusing on what they're doing, practicing attention management, being in the present moment, helping them to be able to manage the, the way or choose what they actually focus on at any one time. And the last one, developing the skills of managers and the workforce. The mind is naturally programmed for growth. Do you have a growth mindset in your organization, a learning culture? Do you encourage people to actually try things out? And it's OK to fail. It's OK if we don't get it right first time, so long as we learn from that. 
are you aware do your managers aware of the five social domains what we call the scarf domains status certainty autonomy relatedness and fairness do you know do your managers know are they aware of how their actions everything that they do and say how it actually evokes either some form of threat response or some form of reward response a simple thing such as a manager going up to somebody and, and you relate it to yourself if your manager comes to you and says can i have a word we naturally tend to go oh, what have i done wrong in actual fact that's created a threat response within that person's that individual's mind which then kicks in our fight or flight which then help actually starts to close down our rational logical thinking abilities making it harder for us to think to be more creative do your managers provide the solutions if a team member asks a question or do you have a coaching culture one that actually encourages them to create their own moments of insights their own aha type moments again we need these coaching kind of cultures our managers need to do more coaching it's far easier and quicker just to give somebody the answer but they don't learn from that and there's no great mental grain from that so in summary we need to if we are going to reverse the trends in mental ill health stress anxiety depression fatigue at work etc we need to create an awareness within of mental health within the workplace first of all we need to make sure that people feel confident to encourage and actually engage in conversations around mental health we need to know how to support individuals and offer that support and then the last thing we need to start to look at how to develop this proactive and sustainable way of developing a mental well-being culture within our organizations so hopefully now we have got about five minutes left for questions so i think rod is going to i, I am i am yep. indeed Michelle. okay <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation thank you now, thank you we we have a number of questions uh, and i can actually put them in two broad categories the first right. category Michelle, is three or four people have actually uh, emailed us or put a question around uh, it isn't just managers it's teams that should look after themselves so what more can be done for team members to look after other team members that's the first category yeah uh, the second category we've had two or three questions uh, about working with remote teams i mean for example uh, we have someone emailed us saying their team gets together four times a year but they mainly use skype and telephone calls so what what advice can you give for managers of remote teams yep okay um first of all look at team members looking after one another totally agree if you can develop the culture the starting place tends to be with the managers first of all in most organizations getting them on board because the managers are very influential of a team culture and if the manager is reluctant to be confident and open about mental health and have these conversations then that actually suppresses that confidence and uh, the openness within the team so that's why i focus focus today mainly on um, managers but quite rightly so yes the more we can have these conversations and evolve the rest of the team and team members looking out for other team members and again in exactly the same way as I've spoken about the manager, you know, it's having those conversations, feeling confident to have those conversations. It's perhaps many organisations nowadays are looking at having a, a kind of a, a mental health first aider, first responder, um, who, it, you know, some are managers, some are team members, that people feel that they can actually go and have those conversations with. So, yeah, totally agree, involve team members where possible. With regard to remote teams, um, again, obviously it, there is the, the challenge there uh, because face to face you're only meeting two, three, four times a year. But it's creating that time whilst we're on the telephone, whilst we're in those Skype calls to have some kind of individual personal time shall we say, time to talk about the individual, checking in with how they're you know how are they feeling uh, you know how how's the workload going etc 
also noting you know any patterns that you can pick up if you know when they're online for example it's looking at, at when they do come online are they kind of quite erratic in their hours that they come online is there a noticeable change in their workload or their their quality of work are they making more mistakes or are they getting through the same workload uh, that you would expect them to so looking for small things like that the other thing that you can do and this applies to remote teams as well as um, face to face teams is you can introduce a wellness action plan a wap plan as it's called and wap plans very concisely basically it's a form form based and everybody including managers all the way up through an organization completes one of these forms and it has just a few questions on and ask people to think about what are the the stresses in the workplace for them what stresses them about their job what are the things that also that energize them about their job what support and help can colleagues give them what support and help can perhaps line managers or their peers actually give them um, so it asks them these questions and the idea is that managers sit down or again this can be done over through skype sit down and have a discussion around that so there is something in place so i know that if you were doing a particular piece of work and you find that particularly stressful i know actually just to kind of be more aware of that and i know what i can do to help and support you through that time that potentially may be a little bit more stressful for you so i hope that helps and gives you, you a, a, yes yeah thank you michelle yeah Okay. Thank you. I think we've run out of time. We have so many questions. So <laughs> I think we've had more questions than ever before. So thank you, Michelle and Rod. Thank you for thank you for the webinar for today. Um, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a copy of a survey on the presentation. We'd appreciate it if you could complete this and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to a recording for today's webinar. And also there's a down uh, there's um, a download which is in your text box, which I suggest everyone downloads before the end of the webinar. We'll also send that, that to you. On behalf of the Institute of Leadership and Management and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.